hands on. I want to thank Professor Yen for the kind invitation for me to present here and to share some of our work um, on the relevant topic. And I think the session was quite interesting. I mean, there were a lot of excellent presentations uh, today. I quite, quite very much enjoy them. So um, we tend to try to take a different approach, you know, looking at the same problem, you know, right even the COVID-19, right even the energy systems, but from a different perspective. Um, our perspective in this particular story really focus on is called waste to energy systems and waste to value added product systems. And as many of us are talking about today, you know, the pandemic is still going on. <laughs> Vaccines are coming out, but we are pretty much, uh, you know, we could see the light at, at the end of the tunnel, but you know, that's not really the end. That's probably just the beginning of the end. And things will likely get worse before it gets better. Uh, as you can see, after yesterday, we have about 64 million people in the world uh, contained COVID. And this pandemic has already taken, you know, more than one million or even up to two million people's life, uh, depending on how the statistics look like. So there's a serious issue and the impact is going to be last for at least several months or even one or two more years. <clears throat> So we tend to look into this problem from two different angles. Um, the first angle is kind of unconventional. You know, where there are not that many people in the energy system community care about, but this is definitely a long lasting problem that our society are facing. And this is the problem of food waste, okay? So um, for those of you that were educated, I would say, you know, in, in a different education system, we just say people dump the milks to the river and dump the milks to the lake because of capitalizing. But in this case, you do see uh, farmers start to dump the meals, uh, you know, dump the meals, smash the eggs and plow the vegetables, just all because of food waste we produce uh, during the pandemic. There are economic drivers here, you know, where the you know, price just drop and demand drop quite a bit as well. But in addition to this, it's really about logistics and about technology options. What else they could do with this, right? Whenever demand drops, whenever price drops, what options these farmers or growers could contribute in this particular setting uh, to adjust some of the issues. And never arguably, this issue really has been a run, you know, forcing farmers to waste the food, or Economic Forum has been reporting issues like these, National Geographic, CNN, et cetera, et cetera. In the US in particular, it's really dairy sector, but, you know, all over the world, it involves things like, you know, all the crops, vegetables, even, the, you know, fresh producers from the shelves in the grocery stores. So this is kind of like an old problem, as we mentioned just now, uh, has been around for a while and our community have been looking into these problems, uh, you know, ever since. You know, whether this we call food, energy, water, waste nexus. But now we do really add a pandemic in the center of this whole story. COVID-19 is definitely relevant to energy as many other, you know, uh, speakers have been presenting uh, just now. But in this particular case here, what you can see is energy, water and food are very much connected. You know, this is the nexus problem that, you know, our, our society, our community have been addressing. But COVID-19 is definitely relevant in the food, as you can see previously from the, uh, the, the news reports. And this is really a waste issue, right? I mean, essentially waste the food, we waste all these organic products. So there are opportunities to use waste of energy systems and waste of energy technologies to utilize some of these resources to create better economic values, to help and support the agricultural sectors and help the economy. Additionally, there are opportunities to also leverage some of the wastewater treatment facilities um, to support these waste uh, processing and waste utilization systems. So which is what we see this COVID-19 overall, it's not only impacting energy sectors, but also affecting the energy, water, food and waste sessions. So food waste in particular in this case here has two major concerns. The first one is the public health concerns. You know, whether you know, we could have pathogens involved in this waste, and we will require more careful and more protection uh, measurements for these workers in these all sectors. The other concern here is kind of an old story. How can we deal with food waste? And the key point here is that, you know, should we go with landfill as what we just did before? What happened if there are virus and pathogens involved in this waste? So we do need to be very careful about how we can handle these uh, food productions and food waste items. Another dimension is really about environment, right? How can we balance these, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, the methane, CO2 emissions? And all these issues are really something in our mind of considerations. So um, our proposal to address some of these issues, which is kind of pretty much aligned with what uh, the governor of New York uh, State, uh, the, uh, Governor Cuomo is thinking about, is try to utilize food waste as a source of energy, 
Okay, Biomix Energy is not its most highly value added products. As you can see in the later part of the story, uh, we do have some other value added products. Full waste is not the most highly value added product, but it's better than nothing. It's better than having the farmers or growers to dump the meals to the rivers, to the lakes, you know, and get nothing out in the end, also pollute the watershed, right? So our objective here is really try to alleviate the public health and environmental concerns. And the main approach involves two steps, right? Step one is really trying to look into food waste processing as we have been working on for many years, right? Using aromatic digestion to convert its food waste uh, into biogas, which is pretty much reaching methane. And this methane natural gas could be somehow used to uh, through combined heat and power systems to produce electricity and heat, right? So this is old story and old technology has been a run. And you can find these enemy digesters in pretty much almost uh, every wastewater treatment facilities and in most kind of uh, dairy farms around the states and so on. So, um, so this is one opportunity to grow. But for this particular problem here, we are looking at a pandemic, right? This is not going to last for 10, 20 years. In fact, it's probably going to be just another one or two more years or maybe a few more months. So the planning horizon is fairly short. And because of this short planning horizon, we are not really considering constructing new facilities. It doesn't make sense to do that unless you could really have a very high you know, uh, rapid uh, construction process in this case. So you tend to look into the existing facilities, uh, existing equipment units that are available on the dairy farms, on existing wastewater treatment facilities, and try to utilize these idle capacities to support the food and agriculture sectors. The additional dimension is looking into all these kind of transportation options. The overall transportation level has been dec decreasing over the months. Now kind of pick up a little bit, but still there are quite a few kind of idle trucks and idle buses that has not been utilized. And these are very much belong to the government, okay, the public sectors. So many of these could be repurposed uh, in this setting. So there's a kind of like a simple and straightforward optimization model in a systems level optimization model, a couple with spatial analysis. We're looking at two objectives. Uh, first one is the total cost, you know, whether, you know, what people do in involve, you know, processing this food waste plus the disposal cost, right? And the disposal cost here could be land filling. If you are not able to utilize them for energy, then you have to land fill it. The other objective is looking at the unit cost of food waste processing after you consider its credits from energy, you know, key and power, et cetera. Subject to a sequence of constraints, many on logistics, on economics, on material flows, and so, et cetera, et cetera, which I will not get into details. So let me quickly show you the, you know, one specific application and the case study that we are considering. And this is the map for the state of New York, right, the place we are located. Uh, we tend to work with governor's office quite closely uh, throughout this pandemic. And I would say really uh, Governor uh, Kona was really uh, supporting science in this particular setting. So what you can see is this is the county level map of the state uh, involves 62 counties. The density of the map, you know, by, by different colors of yellow colors, uh, sharing these food waste production amounts uh, in this particular county, right? These blue dots are uh, based on the size uh, remaining capacities in the wastewater treatment plants. As we mentioned just now, these existing wastewater treatment plants involve anomic digestion facilities, and many of them are not running at full capacity. In fact, we do find that most of them are running at about 20 or 30 percent of the capacity. You know, even under this COVID-19 setting, that most people stay home. Uh, most wastewater treatment facilities tend to have quite a bit of idle capacities that could be utilized immediately for processing this food waste. Then these green dots, uh, we know with the size, you know, some of them smaller, some of them larger, representing the remaining capacities in these on-farm energy digesters. And these are typical large dairy farms. So New York State is the third largest dairy, uh, you know, production state in the U.S., in, uh, rising right behind California and Wisconsin. But we also have quite a bit of dairy uh, processing facilities to make, you know, cheese and yogurts. If you ever, you know, follow Chobani and other, you know, major yogurt producers, they all located in New York State. So this is a story, and this is the data that we have, you know, basically special, you know, different data. What you can see is most idle facilities for wastewater treatment facilities are located, you know, around the city, you know, New York City region, while most farms are in the upstate and the western part of the state, right? So, I mean, basically we have two objective functions, so it's very easy to solve the problem, and we end up with, you know, kind of like a typical Pareto optimal curve showing you the trade-off between, you know, unit processing cost and the total cost, right? And that's kind of like a trend, which is very interesting because if you look at unit total cost, right, total cost means that no matter you do landfill or no matter you do, you know, this waste of energy, you have to handle some, you know, you find some way to handle this waste. You don't want to pour the meal to the river. You don't want to send the vegetable directly to the ground or to the surface, right? So this total cost is always positive because, you know, handling this waste involves certain cost. 
The unit processing cost, on the other hand, really focus on waste energy systems. We don't account for the MPO cost, right? And to some extent, you do see in certain cases, or in most cases, we do have the opportunity to achieve some sort of credit and some possible options that we could get here to even make some money by handling this full waste in this setting. And the other interesting issue is that we could utilize these existing facilities in a very effective way. And arguably, in the end, we define all the waste energy systems tends out to evolve lower cost than, than fueling, just because of the existing you know, facilities that we could utilize and also the very mature technologies on waste energy and combustion power systems that we have already. So this is really a trade-off between economic scale and also the economic drivers from land fueling versus waste of energy. And this is kind of like a trade-off of an economic breakdown of three options. Basically, you have three, three solutions, A, B, and C, as we can see in these three you know, possible plots. And in each of them, you know, some of them have positive you know, uh, margin and some of them have negative cost, depending on you know, specific options, which I'm not getting into the details. So let's quickly look at the maps, right? You know, option A, which is basically the solution you get to see in this case, uh, with the you know least amount of unit processing cost, the maximum of total cost. Basically, we don't process that much for waste, and you can see most of them are really focused on the city region, you know, New York City area. Uh, you know, in, as opposite to these all of available cities, you can see in upstate and western part of the state. And option B tend to be kind of like a you know broader and more distributed in a way. You're looking to around you know all around the states and moving things nearby. This is something that we can really call in across the counties and across the states to handle the logistics. And as you can see, similarly compared to the same facilities, we do have a better utilization of these on-farm facilities in addition to waste treatment facilities uh, in the city. And option three is pretty much a whole scale, you know, state level uh, uh, logistics options to utilize effectively about one third of existing food waste in addition to you know, other options we have. So this is basically the story for this you know, food waste processing state. And we also conduct kind of quick listing schema analysis to find out what's going to be a main driver in the story. And of course, in the end, you can find out price of electricity, as many of our speakers mentioned, is definitely one of the interesting uh, component. Biogas EO is another major contributor. All right. So I just see the message. So I have 10 minutes left. So let me quickly move on to the second story. Um, this is another different angle or different problem. Now we are not talking about food waste. Okay, now let's talk about something that we have been using almost every day when you walk outside, you need to wear a face mask, right? And this amount has been growing. I mean, US is not the largest country in terms of population, in terms of consumption, uh, definitely not in terms of production either. But still, we are producing about uh, 160 million uh, surgical masks every month and about 160 million N95 respiratory masks. And you can see many states are now regulating uh, in the public to wear masks in, you know, when they, whenever they cannot maintain a social distance, and this production has been growing over time. So with this vast amount of face masks and respirators, what's the issue here? How people handle it, uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen some photos like this, in the way that you can find these face masks on the beaches, and you know, collectors will find them you know, around the coastlines, and this nice sea turtle, you know, <laughs> is swimming around together with the face mask. So these are images taken from BBC and New York Times. So these are really growing concerns as we, you know, as we could have more and more waste that these cases. Uh, on one hand, it's really about virus spreading. You know, they could have involved some kind of virus in, uh, infection issues. And these are pretty much we can regulatory uh, regulated uh, medical waste or biohazards. Uh, but these are not very well, you know, I would say processed or packaged in this particular case. The other challenge is that I would say the most important or majority approach nowadays to handle these kind of waste is through incineration. And that's pretty much the best options you could get, right? Cut out all these medical waste, uh, you know, uh, sterilize, them, sterilize them and then do a run incineration as we did for all these land fueling uh, garbages. But incineration tend to lead to higher greenhouse gas emissions and in many cases, uh, quite a bit of economic and uh, environmental and ecological concerns. So in this story, we tend to try to design a new and effective process systems uh, to utilize this waste and to protect the public, right? Our objective is to make sure the production could be effective, the operation could be safe to protect the public and also the workers. And, you know, from a technological perspective, it's really uh, two stage options, uh, combining sterilization with the plastic and polymer processing to better mitigate climate change issues uh, with less greenhouse gas emissions compared to incinerations. So, um, the sterilization systems out there, it's kind of like, has been around for a while. You know, it's not new because you have been, you know, running these sterilization systems to handle all these bio waste. And one of the systems you can see is SDA chem cloth systems. 
it's insulated and automatic, right? They could ensure you know very high uh, processing level, and this is already approved by the state. They could be used to kill the corona COVID nineteen virus once you run to ninety six or one hundred sixty Fahrenheit degree, uh, not Fahrenheit, Celsius, uh, with a steam of sixty minutes. This could be effectively kill all these virus that you would be uh, encountering all this medical waste. And it could also help with the hydration and also shredding process. They could support a downstream thermal chemical uh, processing. So downstream processing is mainly based on this we call thermal chemical technology, and in particular, it's a pyrolysis technology. I know a lot of you know, scholars and uh, colleagues are working on biochar uh, if you're in pyrolysis. So we do have this pyrolysis facility at Cornell uh, to produce biochar, but in this case, you know, we are talking about pyrolysis for plastics, which is also running a similar kind of uh, reaction systems. And this is what we call upcycling, upcycling of this waste respirator. Basically, they involve some sort of fibers, you know, polymers, plastics involved in these waste respirators. They could be utilized to eventually convert them into some sort of higher value added chemicals and fuels. And again, this whole process involves uh, high temperature, uh, some chemical reactions. They could kill the virus. It's fully integrated. It could ensure continuous processing. And arguably, it could lead to less greenhouse gas emissions than incineration. So uh, that's the kind of a whole world flow sheet that we designed. Basically, you know, as you can see, this typical energy system design. We start with this pre-processing, get into cracking. Then you have these separation systems for downstream products, separate all these, you know, CO2 and methane greenhouse gases, and looking to onsite hydrogen to production in addition to onsite combustion for the utilities, etc. I will not give too much details. I think I just see a message. I get five minutes to go, but I think that should be enough to uh, wrap it up. So uh, let me quickly show you what we get here. Okay, again, we focus on New York, but also in this case, we tend to expand the boundary to focus on the, the whole New England region because uh, you know these states tend to have formed some sort of uh, collaboration to handle these medical waste and uh, you know uh, waste respirators. So we look in two cases. Our first case is really okay. One thing of a city uh, in New Jersey, New York region, such that we can handle most of the waste coming from the metropolitan area. And the other cases, you get two facilities, one in this coastal area, and the other one tend to focus on upstate New York and Pennsylvania. So this is kind of realistic in a way some vendors like BioServ has already getting branches in all these states. And economics tends to be feasible, right? We try to locate these facilities next to these disposal sites and major, major uh, demand centers. And this satellite facility could help reduce transferring cost. So a quick economic analysis you could find out is that in, even in a base case, you know, uh, one single facility case, uh, we could really have a processing among about up to 67,000 respirators per hour. So that's kind of quite effective and quite continuous. And cost is also very favorable. favorable. It's about $1.23 per thousand respirators you treated. So in the end, each one of them costs like point one cent or something like that. So that's fairly you know, uh, affordable. And there are some further detailed economic breakdown in the way you can see, you know, we compute this internal rate of return. If you think of a city focus on you know, more dense demand zones, IIR could be up to like 21%, and the other case could be you know, slightly lower, but still quite favorable. And you can detail breakdown in these cases. Um, two things I want to point out here is that uh, capital cost tends to be a major contributor in this case, uh, because you know, we are running this thermal chemical process, we are running this sterilization process, they do involve high cost, right? So chemical cost is a major uh, contributor of economics. And in addition to that, if you look at operation cost, the major, co major contributor comes from utilities, which is a refrigeration cycles. We run these high hydrogen, uh, hydrocarbon separations. They involve some sort of utilities that could be a bit expensive. Uh, from a minor perspective, uh, if you're looking at life cycle assessment, you could define a system boundary like this, covering all the major stages throughout the systems and also involve you know, all the major direct indirect emissions. So this is a sun key chart showing all the material flows, basically from respirators. We also need to add oxygen. We also need to add a makeup uh, nitrogen and makeup water. The outputs would be you know, C2, C3, C4, plus gasoline and a few others, fluid gas, et cetera. Right? So this is the sanky chart showing how these uh, flows are moving uh, from upstream to downstream. Then if you quickly look at the environmental cost, environmental impact breakdown, uh, you can see that the climate change turns out to be the most important you know, contributors across all these categories. Then fossil depletion is another major concern due to this very energy intensive thermal chemical process. But we don't argue that some chemical process are necessary just to kill the virus and to protect the health of the workers. Um, the other two pieces here is you can see that a lot of direct and you know, almost all the indirect emissions plus quite a bit of direct emissions are really contributed for, uh, by this theme and also offsite production of inlet materials. And these are mainly used for sterilization. Again, it's a necessary part and a very unique piece uh, under this COVID-19 pandemic. So last piece here, last information here before I wrap up is this amount of impact here. 
And again, we try to compare this option or this whole technology platform versus incineration, which is the current best practice. And what you can see is no matter if you're looking at one facility or two facilities, um, in both cases, the results are very similar. We can always achieve about 16% greenhouse gas emission reductions compared to incineration. So really demonstrate effect, you know, effectiveness of this approach, you know, whether it's not only economic feasible or economic viable, but also environmentally sustainable with much less greenhouse gas emissions. And somehow this is less sensitive to where you locate the facilities and how far, how many are they are. So uh, let me quickly conclude here. Um, this particular presentation really focused on energy and resource recovery from waste under this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we talked about two, two stories. First one is on food waste and energy and the other one is medical waste or respirators to chemicals and energies. So uh, hopefully I convinced you that this was not only a technology challenge, we need to develop new technology platforms, but there are also issues related to energy systems design operations that we can effectively adjust. So uh, in the first story, you see we could reduce the audit disposal amount of costs and also the disposal amount of food waste significantly in the New York State. And in the second case here, uh, we came up with a new technology platform and a new processing system. They could have a very reasonable and very favorable internal rate of return of 21%, in addition to reducing about 60% of greenhouse gas emissions compared to the incineration basis process. So both papers are now published in the COVID-19 Spatial Asia of Pine Energy, and you are very welcome to check them out if you want to see more details. So with this, let me thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any question if time permits. Thank you.